I just cut two minutes of my half marathon time in 21 days, going from one hour, 13 minutes and 36 seconds to one hour, 11 minutes and 30 seconds. And in this video, I'm gonna show you the five things I did so you can use the exact same principles to improve faster. My name is Nicholas, I'm a sports scientist, physiotherapist and former professional triathlete. Let's start by addressing the obvious questions first. Was it just a faster route? The winner of the first half marathon finished in one hour, nine minutes and 51 seconds, but he was also part of the second half marathon, where he ran a 109.09. The second route had 100 meters less elevation, but it was also more hot and more humid. I'd estimate that the route and the conditions explains a maximum of one minute. But did I just run with a higher effort? No, I actually had a lower average heart rate in the faster half marathon. So did I just pace it better? Also no, I actually paced the second half marathon horribly and ended up running significantly slower in the second part of that race compared to the first part. But when I got to the finish line, I received multiple messages from people asking me, how did you run so much faster in such a short time frame?" But the thing is, to me, it was actually not a surprise. I planned for this. And you can too. Let me explain by telling you about the first thing that I did that you should absolutely steal. It's called tapering. So. What exactly is tapering? A scientific meta-analysis from 2023 defined tapering as a strategy used before a race where you gradually reduce training to peak at the right time. They found that combining tapering with a period of overload training before the taper led to greater performances. It's a phenomenon known as supercompensation. So supercompensation is our body's ability to bounce back better or stronger after a period of overtraining. And if we time it right, then we can arrive on race day in the best shape of our lives. So I planned my training carefully to make sure that once I hit race day, that supercompensation effect would be at its peak. Here's exactly how I did it. First, I had a period of progressive overload, meaning I trained more and more in the weeks leading up to that first half marathon. So leading into that race, I was actually in quite a high training load. I had a couple of easy days leading up to it, but the weeks prior was the highest volume I've done all year. Second, I started cutting my volume exactly 21 days before my A race. So in the week after that first half marathon, I cut my total training volume by about 40% compared to my highest volume weeks, and then the week after that by 50%, and in the final week before my A race by 60%. And trust me, it was hard. My body felt sluggish and I had some of the worst training days I've had all year. So naturally, I started to question everything. But unfortunately, in my experience, that's very normal in a taper. By the way, if you want the exact training plan that I followed tailored to running three to five times per week, you can find it at yournextpb.com. The second thing I did was that I kept intensity high. So even though my volume went down, I actually did VO2 max intervals just three days before the race. Basically, I did the exact same types of training on the exact same days as before the taper. I just did less. I did this because this meta-analysis from 2023 found this to be a superior strategy that would produce the best performance. The third thing I did was that I used the zone of proximal development strategically. So what do I mean by that? Let me tell you a story. When I got kids, we moved to a new city. So all my old training partners and training groups virtually disappeared overnight. So for a few years, I just trained by myself and I got a lot worse. So when I decided that I wanted to try to run faster again, I knew that something had to change. Being so deep in the literature that I am, I knew that I had to take advantage of the zone of proximal development. It's basically a fancy scientific term for training with people at your level or just a bit better than you. If we do this, it's been scientifically proven to make us better. So I reached out to a local club to hear if they had any training groups that I could be a part of. Unfortunately, they did not have anyone who could train at my level, so I kept training alone. Then one of my friends wanted to run faster, so I started training with him and that helped a ton. But something else was about to change. Four weeks before my latest half marathon, the club, they reached out to me. They were assembling a group of former top runners who would train together once per week and they wanted me to be a part of it. And all of a sudden, I had people at my level and even faster than me 
pushing me to get faster. This alone helped me realize that I have so much more to give and I need to stop feeling sorry for myself. On top of that, it just makes it so much more fun to have someone to share the ups and downs with. If you're not already training with someone at your level or even a bit faster, then you're missing out. It does not have to be every workout, but just once or twice per week. Not only will it make running more fun, it will also make you faster. The fourth thing I did to run two minutes faster in just 21 days was that I started to add up all the small percentages. So what do I mean by that? A study from 2020 found that the weight of running shoes had a massive impact on performance. The researchers found that adding just 100 grams per shoe impaired running economy and reduced performance during a time to exhaustion test at a speed close to VO2 max. This means that all other things being equal, how much your shoes weigh will have an impact on your performance. So with that in mind, I decided to run in the lightest carbon plated shoes I could find, which was the Puma Fast R3. But I did not stop there. I bought lightweight laces, I bought lightweight tights, and I bought a lightweight tank top. I also bought ultra lightweight running socks. I shaved off all my excess body hair on my arms and on my legs and on my chest. And I know that might sound controversial to some and not all people will do that. But if you add up all those small things, then you might find 300, 400 or even 500 extra grams. And if you want your maximum performance, you don't want any extra weight on race day. Then on my first race, I did a test setup where I tried a bit more caffeine and I tried to not ingest any gels during the race. And I found that I can tolerate more caffeine, but I need a bit more energy, especially toward the end of the race. That meant that now I had an improved nutrition strategy for my A race, where I would try to get more caffeine, but also a bit more energy. So in the second race, I took a 40 gram energy gel at around the 30 minute mark. None of these small things had the ultimate impact on my performance, but I think that all of them combined did have a noticeable impact. Ever wonder if you're wasting effort trying to improve, but training the wrong way? That was me after my professional career ended, trying to follow old workouts, just copying them, and then wondering why I was not getting better. But then I did something different. I built a specific half marathon training plan that was backed by science. It was minimalistic and designed to max out my results in just three to five runs per week. And I realized that I can still run faster Faster while training less. Once I trimmed all the junk miles and actually made each workout have a specific purpose, everything changed. I made bigger gains on less training. If you want to do the same, make every single run have a specific purpose. VO2 max, a threshold, a long run, or some hill sprints, or even just an easy run to rack up the miles. Then go into that session mentally prepared for the exact result you want. Go into the session with a clear goal in mind and thinking, okay, today I want to maximize that VO2 max, so everything about this training should be so that I hit those heart rate targets when I get to that four by four minute max. Trust me, that intention will make all the difference. I only ran three to five days per week during my sub 112 buildup, but I made sure to hit every key session with intent every week. If life got busy and I had to skip a workout, I would try to do some juggling to see if that workout could just be the easy run. I tried everything I could to hit those quality sessions every single week. You see, the less you train, the more important those sessions become. Also, form and fatigue are more connected than you think. Most runners train their engine, but they forget about their efficiency. My half marathon pace really didn't improve improve until I started training my form under fatigue. A great way to do this is to add some strides to your long runs or to add a progressive long run where the second half is faster than the first half. This actually forces you to run with a negative split. And I trained like that, even though I did not follow the plan on race day. But the lead up was only part of the reason why I ran faster. The second part was the right type of warm up. So to learn exactly how to do a warm up that will make you faster and is backed by science, then you should watch this video next.